Got real Holy Ghost feel in here, didn't it? Why do we act out all like that <laughs> for the Lord? Because we're peculiar people. Scripture in Peter says, we're a royal priesthood, a prophetic nation, peculiar people. Any definition of peculiar that I've ever read, ever read means that you, you act out of the norm. David was peculiar. He danced and said until his royal garments came off. And then his wife was so upset. As royalty, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be carrying on like heathens out in the street. Dancing and carrying on. He said, wait a minute, sweetheart. The Ark of the Covenant just came. I was in the presence of the Lord. He said, if you thought that was strange, I'm going to become even more undignified than this. So my peculiar, undignified believers in the room, make some noise like you've lost your mind for the presence of the Lord. Have a seat if you can. Have a seat if you can. Have a seat. Yes, God. Oh, I'm so excited. As you could probably see. I'm so excited. I'm so excited about the Lord. I'm so excited that we serve a God who can do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us and if you know like I know the same power that conquered the grave lives in us the same power that parted the seas lives in us I'm excited about the power of the Lord that we continue to see working every single day He's, he performs miracles whether you see it or not and I believe yes Lord he's saying I'm even performing a miracle now he said I prepare a table for you it's not prepared I prepare it's present tense I'm constantly preparing a table for you. I'm manifesting my will in your life now. Now. Are you glad about it? Glory to God. So we've been reading. Yes, Lord. We've been reading in this series, Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 focuses on God being a good shepherd. And this is David's account, David's testimony about God being a good shepherd. So if, if you can bear with me, I'm going to read it again. I know we've read it for the past three months, almost every Sunday. Four. Or Brother Orlando said four months. But we're going to read it again. Because the... Because in the beginning was the word. And the word was God. And the word is God. So the more we keep talking about the word, we're, we're glorifying our God. I'm going to read it again. Psalm 23, New Living. Oh, no, we're going to read the New International Version. Now, I need you to hear very close. I don't even have a lot. I promise you I don't. Um, but there's something that we need to hit today. Psalm 23. Matter of fact, sorry, before I read that. We just, we went through what a good shepherd was. And today marks the day where we start the conversation of what it looks like for us to be good shepherds. Why? Because this is the, this is the will of the Lord. 
He desires for us to be just like him, to do the things that he does and even greater. So this launches our, I would say, semi-series of the Good Shepherd, how to be a good shepherd. If I had a title for today, I would call it Greater Works. Come on. Somebody's excited about the word. I love to hear it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So let's go to Psalm 23. Oh, this is going to be good, guys. Psalm 23. New International Version. Verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And I lack nothing. He's my personal caretaker. He takes care of me every time. He makes sure that I have all that I need. I'm not missing a thing because he's been a good shepherd. All I have is all I need. And all I need is all I have. Why? Because he's a good shepherd and I lack nothing. I'm not wanting for anything. He provides everything that I need. Now, there's some personal desires that, I, you know, that I would like to have, but I don't need. I would like to have this and that and mansions and all that and, and just, that's not what I need. Now, if God blesses me with that, halle. Halle. I love somebody finish it. Hallelujah. <laughs> but he provides all that I need. All I have is all I need and all I need. Is all I have. He's mindful of me. He knows that he loves me enough. Well, I know that he loves me enough to provide everything that I need. He's Jehovah Jireh. We sing that song, Jireh, you are enough. I will be content in every circumstance. Why? Jireh, you are enough. Y'all sing it today. I'm going to let you sing it. Ready? Jaira, you sing. Really loud here. Jaira. I will be. I will be content. In. Why? Forever enough, always enough, your forever enough, dear. Mm. Lord, so he provides everything that we need. He's Jaira. Jehovah Jaira, our provider. Now watch this. Verse 2. Verse 2 goes here, it says, he makes me lie down. This is what David says. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. What that means is I find peace in him because he's my good shepherd. He lets me know that everything's going to be okay. There was a prophetic word that went forth about a month ago, and all he said was, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I got you. Why? Because I'm a good shepherd. So I find peace with this God because he's a good shepherd. He fights for me and he takes care of me. He never leaves me alone. That's why I can rest here with him. Now, when I let him be a good shepherd, I can pray without worrying. Scripture says worry about nothing but pray about everything. And you can do that with confidence when you understand how good of a shepherd we really have. Then verse 3 says, he refreshes my soul. What that means is I can breathe again. One verse says, I can breathe again with him. Another translation, I'm reading the NIV, but another translation says, I can breathe again while I'm with him. He lets me breathe. I can find new strength for my weakness here. Oh, he renews my strength. I get the image of God. When I read that, God, he dusts me off. Like, I 
could see him just wiping the dirt off of me. And he says, you look good. It's all right. It's all right. You ever fall down and you're just like, man, I done ruined all my clothes. I wish I didn't hurt myself. I, I, God's like, look, stand up. I'm going to dust you off. You're okay. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. You got a little limp on you, but it's going to be fine. I'll heal that too. He restores my strength. He gives me strength in my weakness. I'm, I'm elaborating because I, I, I'm just reviewing this Psalm 23 because there's something we have to go to that's really important. Then the next line says, he guides me along the right paths for his namesake. He does these awesome things in my life so that he can get the glory. I'm not just doing this for you. I'm doing this to prove that I'm a good God. I, I provide miracle signs and wonders. It's not just for you, but it's to prove that I'm a good God. It's to prove that I'm faithful to fulfill every promise. It's to give me glory. Because if I get lifted up, then all men are drawn. Then I can have more people come and love on me as I love on them. I don't do this just for you. I do this for my glory says he guides me along the right paths for his namesake. I do this to prove my name. I'm proving in your life that I'm Jehovah Jireh. I provide to prove that that's true. I bring you peace to, to, to show that Jehovah Shalom is true. It's my name. I'm always with you to, to show that I'm Emmanuel. I'm the God that's with you that never leaves. I do this to prove my name. One version says he makes foot, footprints that I can walk in. Yeah. Have you ever just, it snowed the other day and it reminds me of that. Uh, you ever just been walking down a path where after it snowed and, and there's these footprints and they show you the, the way to go. Our natural thing to do is to step in those footprints as well. Why? We step in those big footprints so that what's going on around us doesn't affect us. So that the elements don't fully overtake us. Because somebody's already walked the path for us. Do I have to rewind that back? We step in those footprints because there's a path that's already been walked for us. And because it's already been walked for us, we can see which way to go and, and, uh, and what's going on around us. The elements of, of the situation doesn't affect us like they would if I was walking alone. I don't have time to stay there. Verse 4, verse 4, because... If you want to go dig deeper into that, just go through the past four months of messages. This has been the same sermon, same series, and we've been digging into this verse, these verses over and over again. Verse 4 says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. We broke down that, that, that it was a misinterpretation that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It was a misinterpretation of, of the Hebrew term. What it actually meant is, yea, though I walk through the darkest moment of my life. David was saying, yea, though I'm in this situation that should overtake me, I'm not going to fear. Right here in the midst of my problem, right here in the midst of my pain, right here in the midst of my hurt and my heartache, I'm not going to fear. I'm going to stand steadfast because I have a God who's always with me who will protect me. I don't have to fear this problem overtaking me. I don't have to fear the situation winning. One version, one translation says, I don't have to fear because he's already overcome the world. I don't have to fear the rumor about me because he's already won. I don't have to fear the doubt you have against me because he's already won. I don't have to fear this situation winning because he's already won. He's a God. Who, he looks after me. Surely he will take care of me. Yeah, David said, yes, 
Yea, though I walk in this moment, I'm here in this moment, in this valley. But the same God of the mountain is the same God of the valley. He doesn't change. Hmm. It says, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. The way you love me and how you guide me helps me to be comfortable in this situation. David wrote this from a place of, I'm going through something. Have you ever been in a conversation with the Lord in the midst of going through something? I know we all have. That's Usually that's the only time we talk to him. Um, not for everybody. Seasoned saints, I know y'all. Y'all like, uh -uh, I got, listen, I've, I've been on this 40-year relationship. Amen. But that's where David was. He said, I'm going through something. And I'm trying to affirm myself. I'm making declarations over my own life, saying, God, while I'm in this valley, I know you're going to take care of me. I know the way you love me and the way you guide me will pull me out of this. Then verse 5 says, you prepare a table for me. Before me in the presence of my enemies. Oh, in plain sight of my enemies. We're going to dig there for a second. You manifest your will. What that, we broke that down. We read it in Hebrew and kind of broke down every word of what that meant. That scripture means, that line means, you set order in my life as you manifest your will for me. So the moment I start trusting and following you, you start to set order. You start to remove some friends that really aren't for me. You start to bring in real supporters, real people who really love me. Really love me though. Really love me. Like God says, love me. You begin to set order in my life. You begin to bring me things that, that, that help push me to destiny and purpose. As soon as I choose you and you begin to, to start to bother me about the things that don't need to be in my life. Yeah, you ever felt that? This thing that you thought was good and all of a sudden God starts poking you about it like, mm -mm. nope, you probably need to stop that. I'm telling you, you need to stop. I'm going to uncover you soon if you don't stop. That's the sermon. That's conviction. And it says, you prepare a table for me. You manifest your will before me, right before my eyes. You begin to set order. You lead me to my purpose and destiny. Now watch this. It says, in the presence of my enemies. You prepare this table. You prepare miracle signs and wonders, blessings. You open up heaven upon me. You bring heaven here to earth for me and everybody connected to me. And also in the presence of my enemies. What does that mean? We broke that down before. In the presence of those who doubt what you're doing in my life. In the presence of those who will lie on me. In the presence of those who want to stop what, you're, what God is doing. There are, listen, there are witches and warlocks and people who don't like you are real. They are real. And oftentimes led of the enemy. They don't know why they do these evil things in your life. They just, they just get a feeling to do it, tempted to do it, and then they do it. And don't feel bad afterward. Be prayerful over who your camp is. Who's in your camp? Be mindful of who's in your camp. Now watch this. It says, I'm going to do this in the midst of all of them. But also, it's not just the outward enemy, but it's the inward enemies. I'm going to release heaven upon you right in your self-doubt. I'm going to release heaven upon you right in, your, in the midst of your insecurities. Right when you think it's your, you're not worthy enough. I've, I've, I've felt that. I've seen God's hand just move in my life. And I was like, man, God, I'm, I'm not worthy to do that. I'm not worthy enough to, to walk in this image that you created me to be in God I find myself choosing me more than I choose you and that's not okay 
And God says, but I prepare this table right there in plain sight of that, of, of, of that feeling. I, 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 I prepare a table for you right in plain sight of what's going on. Right when you think that I'm not going to do it, I do it. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies, my self-loathing. That's when he does it. Even, even in the midst of my dirt, he still prepares. Because we ain't been clean our whole life. <laughs> still. Still not. But he prepares a table right there. Right there when I had a funky attitude that I shouldn't have had and I was just rude to people. He prepared a table. He was there. God says, listen, listen, I'm, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing in your life, but we're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with it. But that doesn't stop me working in your life. You don't, your works doesn't cause me to move on your life. I don't bless you based off your works. I release heaven upon you because you believe in me, you trust me, and you love me. And I love you. What I do is not contingent upon what you do. We, that's, that's a false teaching, guys. Because the scripture says not by works alone. Right? We'll dig, we'll dig into it more. I promise you we will. But he prepares a table for me. And he says that nothing can separate you from the way I love you and what I'm doing in your life. Neither height nor depth. Y'all know the scripture. Or anything in all creation can separate you from the way I love you. Then the next line says, this is just review, guys. The next line says, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Still in Psalm 23. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And what God is saying through David here is that I'm, you're supposed to be here. That's what it means when I anoint you to sit at this table. I'm anointing you. I'm putting a sign on your head that says this, this is their chair. This is Colette's chair. Nobody can sit in Colette's chair but Colette. I prepared this chair, this table for her before the foundation of the earth, and I declared this good. I've anointed you to be here. I've anointed you to be here. We broke down what that meant, the anointing in that scripture says that you're the honored guest. You're the honored guest. God says, I anointed you to be here because I'm saying that you're the honored guest and I don't mind breaking open my alabaster box upon you every time you show up. Mm. That pressed against some of y'all's theology, didn't it? God says, you're the honored guest. You're royalty. You have a seat with me at all times. Why? Because I love you. I call you my son. I call you my daughter. I call you royalty. And when I anoint you to be here, I anoint you regardless of what your journey looks like. And then I begin to pour out all of heaven upon you. It says my cup overflows. When you feel like you've had enough, I keep pouring. When you feel like you're not worthy enough, I keep pouring. When you feel like, okay, God, just give me a moment. Let me do this. And God, he just keeps pouring these new things. He just keeps pouring these new dimensions of glory. He just keeps pouring these new blessings. He just keeps pouring these new miracle signs and wonders. God, I'm, okay, I'm at a place where I'm, I'm content. And he's like, nope, I'm going to keep pouring. I don't stop. And then the scripture says, then my cup overflows. That means what God begins to do in my life begins to spill over in those that's connected to me. It begins to spill over into the lives of others. The more he keeps pouring into me, the more it's, it's, it's contagious. 
It's not for me to keep myself. But it's for me to share with everybody else. That's how good this good shepherd is. He says, I use you as a conduit to bless everybody else. What I'm doing in your life literally shifts the lives of those around you. Oh, Jesus. Last verse. Last verse. Yeah, this is my fun one. Surely, surely his goodness and his mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Surely his goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. What does that mean? I'm confident that all that you are and all that you desire for me will chase me down because you love me. NIV says, surely your goodness and love will follow me. King James says, surely your goodness and mercy will follow me. We broke down what, what, it, what, it, what it meant in Hebrew. Follow. It was used multiple times in a word, but as it's translated, it's translated to chasing you down. Surely all that God is and all he desires will chase you down. Surely means I'm confident that this will happen. Why? Because I didn't choose you. You chose me. I'm not chasing after you, but you're chasing me. If I slow down just enough and stop chasing what I want to do, all of heaven will collide into me. I'm able to experience heaven on earth if I just choose to slow down. Stop running after what I want and allow you to lead me into what you want then I can experience on earth as it is in heaven. Here, now. And then the last part, Brother Orlando so eloquently preached on <laughs> last week. It says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will abide in the presence of the Lord forever. I will rest in his presence forever. This was, now this was what's crazy. Me and Orlando, we've had a lot of conversations about this um, as we prepared for this series. What's crazy is this was a prophetic declaration of David. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David spoke of an omnipresent God who wasn't omnipresent at the time. David spoke of a, a God that he knew that was in a box that he had to go to to encounter. But what David was saying is in this verse that I know that you love me enough that there's going to come a time that I don't have to go to the temple to find you. I know that there's going to come a time where death, hell, and the grave won't be a separation from me in your presence. That my, I can experience you here all the time, all day, every day, walk with you at every given moment. And then after death, that's not going to change. That was a prophetic declaration of David. This was pre-Jesus. This was pre-new dispensation of grace. That he talked about this God and life after the grave. Oh my God. Oh my God. That stuff excites me. Mm, that was a foreshadow of everything that Jesus was about to do. That's why Psalm 23 is so good. And here's the crazy thing. Here's the thing that blows me away. Here's the nucleus of what we're going to talk about. And I, I literally, that's, I got two little things to say about it. And we're going to move into something. <sighs> Jesus Christ, hallelujah. So we read about this shepherd, this good shepherd in Psalm 23, which was a declaration and prophecy of David. And then Jesus himself, Jesus himself comes around in John 14. I'm going to read the Berean Study Bible. John 14, if you could put it on the screen for me. Oh, but it's going to be good, guys. John 14, 11 through 14, watch this. Jesus comes around and says this, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. We're saying that I'm God. God is in me. God is me. I am the Father, the Father is in me. That's what he's saying. Then he says, eh, or, this is Jesus talking, or 
at least believe on account of the works themselves. What did he mean? He says, at, believe that I'm the Father, believe that God is me, I'm with God, I, God works through me. But then he said, if you're struggling in that belief and you still got some growth to do, like a lot of us, he said, can you at least believe that God's real and he performs miracle signs and wonders through me? What he's saying is whether you understand the whole situation, whether you need to sit and do some more studying and try to figure it out and sit with some teachers to kind of break it down to you, regardless of what your faith is, what Jesus is saying, at the least can you believe that God is real and miracles are real and they're flowing through me. He's saying if you could just believe just on that. Next verse, verse 12 says, truly, truly, I tell you, he says, whenever it says that, it says, this is very important. Listen up, settle down. You need to hear what I'm about to say. It says, truly, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I'm doing. Wait a minute. He said, believe that I'm God. And if you have a problem in believing that I'm God and God sent me and the Father lives in me, if you're struggling in that belief, can you at least believe that God is real and miracles are real? So then verse 12 says, if you could just believe in those things or work on believing in those things, you will be able to do the same works that I'm doing. Wait a minute. In my study time, there was a lot of a lot of biblical teachers were trying to break that down and say that that's not that that Jesus wasn't being literal. I believe that was a dis, that was a, a disconstruction of our faith. If it wasn't literal, then I believe Jesus would have said it. Now you got to catch what's happening at this moment. Jesus saying, "I'm about to leave." He's talking to the disciples. I'm about to leave and go with the Father. But here's, verily, verily, I tell you, here's some important things that I need you to know before I leave here. It's so important that you have to hear exactly what I'm saying. If you believe this, then you can do exactly what I've been doing. What does he mean? Because the disciples have seen him perform miracle signs and wonders over and over again. They've seen people break open the roof and raise down and lower down people and they were healed. They've seen Jesus spit in the dirt, rubbing in people's eyes and they were healed. They seen somebody touch the hem of his garment and was healed. They seen all these miracle signs and wonders, feeding of 5,000, whatever the number is. Just all these crazy things happen. And then Jesus tells them, listen to me, this is very important. If I could just get you to have a little bit of faith that God is real, miracle signs and wonders are real, and, and, he's you, and he used me to bring them forth here, you could do the same thing. You can do the same thing. And then Jesus has the audacity to add to it. He says, not only that, not only that, part B of that verse says, you, he will do even greater things than this, than these. He's talking about you. You will be able to do what I did, all that walking on the water stuff, and that was light work. You'll be able to do that and even greater than that. You'll be able to do all the things that I did because it was God working through me. You'll be able to do all of these things and more if you just believe. How does that make sense? Because Jesus, he, he had, there, was a, there was a certain area that he kind of resided in, Galilee and all that. But he's saying, wait a minute. But if you believe and you allow me to do these things through you, you could take this whole thing around the world further than I can walk. You know how many people you can lay hands on in your whole lifetime? Because I couldn't start doing this work until I was 33. That's what he was saying. And then I had a certain amount of time to do these things because I had to fulfill the promise. But if you start now, you'll be able to do even greater. Because there are going to be new diseases and things and that pop up and COVIDs and all this crazy foolishness. But then I got you here. I got you here. And when you lay hands on them, I'm working through you. Because he said, I just believe that I'm the father and the father is in me, that miracles are real. And it's God working through me because I am God. But if I come and dwell within you, oh my goodness, when I come and dwell within you, I can do that and much more. 
if you believe. Now watch this. This is where it gets crazy. Why? Why is this true? This is, watch what Jesus says. You will be able to do even greater than these. Why? Because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name. Why would I do whatever you ask in my name? He says, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I'm going to do whatever you ask in my name to prove that I'm a good God. I'm going to do whatever you ask in my name to prove that what I said is true. God is not a man that he shall lie, nor the son of man that he shall repent. I'm not going to backtrack on anything that I said. I'm not going to renege on anything that I've done. If you just believe, I'm going to, I'm making a sign in heaven. And I'm going to say, look here, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because they asked in my name. What does that mean? Why is it so important to ask in his name? This separates churches here. I know. Here's the thing that separates churches. Ah, Jesus Christ, Mary and Joseph. Ah. Well, wait, before I say that, yeah. yes, Lord, because he wants me to share this. I'm doing this to prove that I'm God. To prove that God is real and miracles are real and they flow through me. I'm doing this to prove that I'm Jehovah Jireh. I'm doing this to prove that I'm Jehovah Rapha. I'm doing this to prove that I'm Jehovah Shalom. I'm doing this to prove that I'm Emmanuel. I'm doing this to prove that I'm bigger than COVID. I'm doing this to prove that I'm bigger than cancer. I'm doing this to prove that I'm bigger than your disease or your situation or your problem. I'm, I'm doing this to show you that I'm bigger than these things because I'm God. That every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that I'm Lord. Watch this. And he says, if you ask in me, in me, in my name, for anything in my name, I will do. Why is that so important? When you ask in the Father's name, because he said, first, remember the first part, verse 12. You can't understand this without understanding verse 12. Verse 12 says, believe in these things. Verse 14 says, if you ask in my name, I'll do it. What he's saying is, when you say in the name of Jesus, it proves that you believe that I'm real. It proves that it's a sign. It's a, it's a symbol that says, wait a minute, be healed in the name of Jesus. What that says is, wait a minute, I have faith that Jesus is real and miracle signs and wonders are real. And I'm going to seal it in the name of Jesus. He said, if you ask in my name, then I will do it. Why? To prove that the Son of God is real. It literally says that. It ain't about you. It's about me proving myself. And I just need you to give me a sign that you believe. That you believe. It's a sign saying in the name of Jesus. It's a sign that you believe that God is real, that God performs miracles, signs, and wonders. It's a sign that says I am not doing this, but it's God doing it through me. When I say in the name of Jesus, when I'm praying for you, it literally takes it off of me and says this is God doing it, not me. I'm, I'm just a vessel, and this is God doing it through me. I, the image I got, the image I got while preparing, I was like, man, when we're praying for people, or when we're praying for ourselves and our family, and we seal that thing in the name of Jesus, what I saw was a multitude of angels. They just came out of nowhere, and they began to send signal flares to the Lord. We are like, God heal in the name of Jesus. All I heard was <laughs> angels were sending signal flares to heaven. And it, and it was God, like, wait a minute. Somebody's praying and they believe. Somebody's praying and they believe. And then what I saw was it was an image of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit down there where the signal flyers are going up to heaven. And the Holy Spirit is down there saying, Kumbaya, my Lord. Come by, yeah, my Lord. Sometimes we don't understand what that means. The translation of that is come by here. Come by here, my Lord. Someone's praying. Come by here. Someone's fasting and praying. Come by here. Someone's singing. Come by here. It's a signal to the Lord that somebody believes. And God says, because you, you put a sign on that thing, it said that you believe I'm going to do it to prove that I fulfill everything that I say I'm going to do. Mm, my Jesus. On earth as it is in heaven. 
So if you could keep that image in your mind that verse 12 talks about, and I'm going to break some, some theologies here a little more. Verse 12 talks about if you could just believe, he says, or at the least believe that miracles are real and signs and wonders are real. That's why a child who ain't grown up in church, who don't know everything about all the scriptures, but they can have enough faith to say, well, I know that there's a Jesus and he's real and heal him in the name of Jesus. Amen. They don't, they don't have our fancy words. They don't have our shata under the bosies. They don't. They don't. But, but they could just, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I've seen it. My son, Caleb, he loves to pray. He lo I mean, if you met Caleb, you just know that he's my passionate one. He loves to pray. If I say that I have like a headache, he walks over to me and he says, Daddy, can I pray for you? Oh, if we just had that response. How you doing? Oh, my head hurt. Can I? That's the first. Can I, can I pray with you? Because what Caleb knows, he may not know all the books of the Bible. He may not know. He, he, he hasn't been to your five-fold ministry school. He hasn't been sitting in the pew for 30, 40 years. All he knows is there's a God. He's real. And he performs miracle signs and wonders. If I ask and I say in Jesus' name. If we could just cut off all the extra fat and get back to what John 12 said, just believe and watch me perform miracle signs and wonders. Now, my son, son Caleb, he'll just lay hands on my head and say, Father, heal. Jesus, please heal my dad's head. In the name of Jesus, amen. And then he backs up and he says, how you feel? Because he, he believes. It's... It's, it's, no, it's no gray area. It's, I, wait a minute. I was taught that if I lay hands on him and I pray, and regardless of what I did today, I know I got in trouble. I know I got on punishment. I may have got a spake in the day, but I know that God will still use me. So if I lay hands on my dad and I pray for him and I say, in the name of Jesus, after that, he should be healed. That's my expectation. Oh, if we could just get back to that. There's no other prerequisites to God performing a miracle but just believing. That's it. I don't need the degree. I don't need the, 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 the license that says I've studied up under healing and deliverance and I can bring you through this thing and I can take you through a night of, of, of tearing and praying and you thought, no. I, Listen, John 12 says, believe. If you believe that miracle signs and wonders are real and you seal that thing in the name of Jesus, he literally says, I will do it. There is no if you went to Bible study. There is no if you spent two years in this thing. There is no if you fasted and prayed and, and your, your prayer language just comes off like a machine gun. No, there is none of that. He said, if you believe and you lay hands and you seal that thing in the mighty name of Jesus. Because I know we say a whole bunch of stuff. We got our prayer language is off the chain. Some of y'all pray really awesome. We, oh, our God. Gracious God of heaven and earth, the one who sees, the one who doesn't see, the one who's able, the one who's from the, all that. I don't need all that. I need healing. I need healing. As a brother in Christ, I just asked you, listen, this is what's going on in my life. Pray for me. I don't need your, hey, man, I don't need all that. Your distraction. I don't need all that. What I need for you to believe with me. I'm not saying all of that is wrong. Because some of us are very sensitive in the spirit. I get sensitive. So I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm, I'm saying it's not needed.
I'm going to say it again. For the over-doctrinated. It's not needed. Based off the word of God, it's not needed. Believe. And seal that thing in the name of Jesus. There are reasons for some of the other stuff. There's a reason for praying in the spirit. There's a reason for, for, for calling out every armor of the Lord. There's a reason for that. But there are times where all you need to do, I don't, I don't need you to list off every armor. With the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the spirit, I call that. I don't, I don't need that. I have a tummy ache. Can you pray for my stomach? In the name of Jesus, amen. Done. If you feel like it's not enough, that means you don't believe enough. I'm, t I'm tired of church, bro. I'm tired. I'm tired of the over church. God gave me a word years ago. He said, don't take all that. It don't take all that. I started questioning a lot of church stuff. Why, why y'all do that? Well, you know, because we learned. But does, does it take that? Is that what the Bible says? Well, no, because tradition says tradition. Oh, that's religion. I call that kingdom religion. Religious kingdom. <sighs> I've seen him move mountains before, and I believe he'll do it again based off what he said. We are, you heard the term deconstructing faith. We are deconstructing religion in this hour. It always blew me away, and I'm, I'm closing. It always blew me away how a child could not do all the things that I had to do, but God still answers. That's crazy. Which means that I got it wrong somewhere. Or I was taught wrong. Or I just flowed into a religious system that had already been, but nobody shifted it. My prayer for you this week, and we're going to do something special. Can you move this out of the way? My prayer for you this week. <sighs> and we trim the fat off. That one, we start to believe. He said, start there. He said, believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me. Then he, then he flips and says, or at the, at, at the least, believe that miracles are real. And that God is real. And he does them through me. Can you at least believe that? And then he says, I, you will hear from heaven. And I will answer you. And I will do exactly what you asked me to do. To prove my name. When you seal that thing in the name of Jesus, it says, look. I'm not doing this, but it's God doing it through me. So we will step out the box. It will be a little peculiar. No, before I say that. That's your assignment this week. Be ready. Be ready to do greater things. And, and don't let the enemy fool you and make you feel like it takes a whole bunch. Amen. I remember uh, we had this prayer line. And um, it was Sister Arguleen. She came through this prayer line and I felt an urge to like pray for her forearm slash wrist. And I'm like, oh, she a seasoned saint. She been here for a while. I can't fumble over my prayer. My natural, I went there. I'm being honest. Like I went there like, oh, shoot, I better say the right thing because she going to call me out afterward. Like, look here, son. But as she came down, I just trusted God. I said, look, God, I don't know what to say. And I grabbed her arm and I said, heal in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I remember, I'll never forget because she stood there for a moment. And I was like, oh, she's about to say something. <laughs> and then she just prayed and kept walking. I let it, I let it be. I said, God, you're going to do what you're going to do. I don't even know what the situation was. Then the following week in my life, she right there, raise your hand following week she shows up she says 
Well, Troy, let me tell you something. I had arthritis pain in my arm Sunday. And it was just hurting. And you prayed and you, when you touched me, I was healed. Am I lying? She right there. Point was, I didn't know what to say. I didn't have any handed about she's to do. It was just, I know she needs to be here. I feel that in my spirit, and I'm just going to be obedient. And I cut out all the fat. In the name of Jesus, do what you're going to do with this arm, whatever's wrong with it. Amen. And God answered. I believe because she believed and I believed. So don't let the enemy, don't let the enemy fool you guys. Make you feel like you have to be on some sort of place or platform for miracle signs and wonders to flow through you. Even the babies can perform miracle signs and wonders if they believe. He said that I prepared a table for you regardless of where you are. Regardless of what your journey is. Wow, what an amazing experience, an amazing word and teaching from the Lord, our good, good shepherd. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for being such a good shepherd to us. We thank you for the journey that we take us through, Lord God, as we follow you as the good shepherd. We thank you for your son that lives in each and every one of us as believers, Lord God. Lord, help those that may not know you now to know you to be the good shepherd that we know you to be in our community of faith. Lord, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth now as it is in heaven. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Man, I am so excited for what is happening as a result of this message. If you want to support our house with a financial gift, we ask that you do so in whatever way it suits you best. But we do have a few ways for you to do that. We do have in person. You can send it to 5550 Reading Road, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45237. Or even better, you can come on by and drop it off yourself. We'd love to sit with you, to pray with you, to talk with you, and to get to know you better. You can also do it online at our website, www.tsmbchurch.com. Click on the Give tab and follow the simple, safe, and secure instructions. Also, you can do it via text. That's right. You can text one word, give well, to 94000. You'll receive a text in response that also has a link for you to follow and to give in a safe, secure way. And finally, you can do it via our app. We especially want those of you who are joining us virtually to download our app so you can stay connected. But you can also give via our app in the Give tab there. And the app is TSMB Church. You can find it, Google Play, Apple Store. You can do it there. We ask that you please participate with us virtually via our app. Again, we want you to stay informed, stay connected, and know that we love you and that the Good Shepherd loves each and every one of us. God bless you. See you all again.